Des Moines. While Mondale and others have spent tens of thousands of dollars on TV ads, others either haven't had the money or haven't taken Iowa seriously enough to advertise here. Mary Stuckey, News 11 in Des Moines. Walter Mondale is on his way to New Hampshire right now. Today was his last day here in Des Moines before the caucus is on Monday. But before leaving today, in an exclusive interview, he evaded a question about how Monday's race will come out. Don't have the slightest idea, and I'm not taking anything for granted. It feels good. Beginning here in Iowa, Walter Mondale recognized the News 11 commitment by offering exclusive one-on-one -on -one interviews. He wasn't alone. Gary Hart and Jesse Jackson both took time for lengthy talks with us. In San Francisco, if it comes down to it, would you accept a vice presidential slot if offered? No. Not at all? No. Unquestionable? Unquestionable. I'm running for president. I think of the three of us, the one who's most qualified to be vice president is Mondale. He's had it before, and I think he ought to consider he did a good job. Maybe he should perpetuate it. And I don't want to get in the habit of being number two. It's not a part of my upbringing, not a part of my character. But the overall coverage had to have a plan, too, so it wouldn't be superficial. We tried to answer the criticism of television that says the medium never covers issues. Our Adlai Stevenson has been covering the Mondale and Hart campaigns, and tonight has a look at the two candidates. One week ago today, the race for the Democratic presidential nomination took a sudden and unexpected turn. Walter Mondale won as expected in Iowa, but John Glenn came in a week fifth and this man, Gary Hart, did surprisingly well. It sets the race up that I always felt would, have, would emerge from this, and that is a contest between the party's future and its past. It's not a question of what's new or old. It's what's right or wrong and what's works and doesn't work. For all of their rhetoric, the two men are surprisingly close on most of the issues. It's their image makers that set them apart. Yes, it was that Adlai Stevenson. The grandson of the former presidential candidate is also a veteran television reporter. And he knows Mondale well. He was hired to cover the campaign. As we went from state to state, we also tried to be sure people in Minnesota understood the way that state was likely to vote and why. Spring is just unfolding in the Northeast. People in Connecticut really have better things to think about right now than politics, but here, in a feisty state where the lieutenant governor once threatened to invade Massachusetts because the border between the states isn't exactly flat, Gary Hart is hoping to regain momentum. Good to see you. Thank you. Hart has campaigned hard here. A win would give him a sweep of all six New England states. Keep it up. I don't have to tell you, this is a close campaign. Mondale has hardly been here at all, just one 90-minute stop so far. And his own supporters admit he's lost what used to be a big lead. Every significant arms control fight of our time. The list of people who live or have lived in the Nutmeg State is impressive, from the last of the Red Hot Mamas, the man who built the circus, and the Oklahoman who never met a man he didn't like, on through the people who wrote our dictionary, invented the cotton gin, wrote acted, won the Nobel Prize. Why Connecticut? Well, here's one reason, no income tax. As early as 1697, two towns seceded from New York and tried to become part of Connecticut because of low taxes here. The king forced them to go back. This small state has four distinct geographical areas. Let's look at them, beginning with Fairfield County. Here, you'll find scenes that are thought by most of the nation to be typical of the Northeast. And the radio stations offer some rather strange talk here. Now, I can imagine Ronald Reagan naked, but I can't imagine, I wouldn't want to see Walter Mondale without any clothes on. Fairfield County is a New York bedroom community. Polls indicate it may go to Gary Hart. North of Fairfield County is Waterbury and the Berkshire Hills. The land here probably is more like Minnesota than any other section of America. Meadows, lakes, lots of water. But with the rolling Berkshires in the distance. It's also very much like New Hampshire. Clean, very old. 
The race was thought to be a toss-up here, but guess what we heard when we asked? I don't know why, but I, I prefer uh, Hart. <laughs> I suppose if I had to vote some, for someone, it would be Hart, because uh, he's making more sense than any of them. I think we admire uh, Mondale. He's a fine, honest, able man and uh, distinguished experience. But it does seem to me that Hart has a better chance of winning. This section now looks like Hart country. Next door, the state's capital city dominates much of the thinking. This is where Walter Mondale has a chance. Hartford is high tech, the insurance capital of the nation where defense dollars pour into United Technologies headquarters. Pat Sheehan is the best known television newsman in the state. I think you're going to see, uh, you're going to see a very strong split between, uh, I think Jesse Jackson is going to do very well in the Hartford area, and I think you're going to see a surprisingly strong Mondale vote in this state. I really believe the greater Hartford area is going to be giving a lot of support to Mondale. I don't think he'll do as well in those other sections of the state. Here, where the old line politicians support him, Walter Mondale looks pretty good. So it could be that the shoreline, dominated by New Haven, will call the race. Connecticut shoreline provides a combination of landscape pictures. Cutting winds that drive a saltwater mist into your face, that's typical of a New England coast town, with the climbing spires on the green that we all got used to in New Hampshire. Walter Mondale, if his travel plans hold, won't set foot in this district. And he probably won't get very many votes here either. For some years, Gary Hart lived here. In the late 50s and 60s, he was behind the ivy-covered walls at Yale. His daughter was born in New Haven, a point he makes every time he's in the area. Andrea was born in New Haven. Andrea Hart. And so it comes down to the shoreline. Just 38 miles south of Hartford, but of an entirely different nature, where Gary Hart feels at home and should win the popular vote in Connecticut. This state was supposed to be a meaningless primary, but it may become a place where Gary Hart's son rises again as he works to change the momentum of the campaign going into New York. Tom Kirby, News 11 in Connecticut. The commitment brought a pretty interesting study of America to our viewers, and a great study of a classic seesaw battle between two men from states where Gannett has television stations, Colorado and Minnesota. We have to be honest, though. Around the time we hit Massachusetts, we were pretty tired of the polls. Now, don't cast off this idea, because in Boston, there's hardly anything as important as fishing, or selling fish, or eating fish. Just show up at the Boston Fishing Pier at 6 in the morning for the unloading of a haul, and you'll see what we mean. Paddock, offered $1.75. Paddock. While we watch the auctioning off of over 25,000 pounds of fish, we realize the big catch goes to the highest bidder. And that's not so different from the primary process. So while all eyes are on the polls, we decided to test the political waters, casting a fishy eye towards the candidates. Jesse Jackson has the soul, but never had the support. His campaign deep-sixed here. John Glenn can't be him. His stripes aren't the kind that swim in Massachusetts. As for McGovern, he had luck with the Cape of Cod back in 1972, but he's all bait and no bite now. That leaves Hart and Mondale. Mondale's been floundering ever since Iowa. The wave of support seems to be flowing with Gary Hart. So holy mackerel, he just might be the answer. What do the salty, sensible, seaworthy men of the seaport say? The fish on the line is clearly... I would give Glenn a shot. He's a military man. Mondale might make it, I believe. I'm not, I'm not sure. But like I say, I'm too busy into fishing than I am into politics. I'm swinging a little bit towards Hart, a little bit. Yeah, Hart. I think so. You get a lot of push behind them. So here, beside the deep waters of the Boston Harbor, the people of the pier seem to be looking for an upstream swimmer who can spawn a few new ideas. Of course, some prefer to ignore polls. 
they'd rather sit on them. We just hope this fishy tale provides a political insight for you and that you didn't swallow our point, hook, line, and sinker. Marty Burns Wolf, News 11. Anything to help clarify the race. Uh, there were, at first, too many candidates. That's pretty good. Seems everywhere you turn, you can find a candidate. Have you got that? In your home or backyard. <laughs> on the phone. Yes, this is John Glenn. How are you? And on your TV. The candidates have bought more television time here than ever before. All we need is a president who will challenge us. That's what he says, but look what he's done. With all this exposure, you'd think just about everyone in New Hampshire would have seen the eight Democratic candidates somehow. After all, New Hampshire is supposedly the most politically savvy state in the nation. But how savvy are they? Armed with USA Today photos, with the candidates' names crossed out, News 11 set out to see if the residents could tell us who they knew. John, I mean, uh, Gary Hart, um, McGovern, I think, I'm not sure, and then Jesse Jackson. The one on the far right is Glenn. And I can't recall the man in the middle or the man on the left. Uh, it's Hart, Jackson, and Hollingsworth. Okay. Well, there's Hart on the left there. Reggie and Jackson. Jesse Jackson on the right. Did you say Reggie Jackson? No, Jesse Jackson. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, Bondo, I don't know. Uh, what we'd like to know is whether or not you can uh, identify these candidates. And do you I say believe something? it's the uh, first one. I have no idea. I believe that's Cranston and looks like Glenn. Okay. Hart, Jackson. I haven't seen him. Hopefully, the voters knew them a little better when it got down to three major candidates. Though it must be noted that there remained some lesser candidates throughout. Minnesota's other candidate was one. When it comes to experience, Harold Stassen is overqualified. By his own count, he has run for president seven times. Others say he has missed the opportunity only twice in the last three decades. He calls it a lifelong fight for peace. Each time you can see some concrete results, in other words, I helped stop that Vietnam War. So sometimes you have an accomplishment where the media will call it a loss, but you know you accomplish what you set out to do. He is in the twilight of a long and successful career. From modest beginnings on a dirt farm in Dakota County, he went on to become a three-term governor of Minnesota. He gave the keynote address at the Republican convention in 1940 and later served in what he calls the very center of the Eisenhower administration. But now the temporary secretary at his campaign headquarters in Concord spends most of her time knitting. After a rare visit from the outside, she lays out the buttons that have been used and reused over the years. Do you ever get bored? That's how we bring on knitting. <laughs> the large crowds like this one are not part of Harold Stassen's campaign. He plans to win by using the media. If the people start to respond and start to give me some support, then the media will pay more attention. If the media pays more attention, I'll get the message out to more people. Who is Harold Stassen? Um, I couldn't tell you, sir. Well, he runs every time, but I don't know what for. <laughs> he maintains that people take his campaign seriously, but he also says that he is realistic. The dean of the Dark Horses hasn't finished what he calls a long and honorable campaign. Adlai Stevenson, News 11, Concord. Well, we could go on. There are literally hours of tape. Going to every primary was a huge undertaking. But there aren't a lot of years when a local story calls on a station to follow a presidential candidate. Walter Mondale got to know the cameras of News 11 pretty well. Hello, right. hello, Minnesota. The governor wants to say, say hello, Minnesota. Best things in the world to Minnesota. Uh, Barbara Canelli would like to. Where are you, Barbara? Say hello to Minnesota here. Hello, Minnesota. How are you? Where's the lieutenant governor? Right here. Yeah, yeah here's the lieutenant governor. Like to say hello to Minnesota. Hello, Minnesota. Hey, you we got, we got a lot you more. You did beautiful right? there. That was wonderful. Now that you've met the cabinet. Would you like to say hello? Yes, I most certainly would. Right. Say hello to Minnesota. Hello to all the Minnesota people, certainly. Uh, here's a guy named Stolberg. That would go over good in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> Any time. <laughs> Thank you, Fritz. That's hey, great. You've that, you that, already that's carried your, Minnesota, that's Fritz. That's your lead tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Did we ever? Well, maybe not the lead, Fritz, but it's pretty good for a close.